Um, hey guys, Hi. David Theodore, um, security researcher at the Ethereum Foundation. Been a security researcher for many, many years. Um, played with a lot of cool things, but I think I'm in love with Ethereum, so I'm probably here to stay. Um, who am I? dtheo.eth. Infosecule on Twitter, uh, GitHub, Reddit, a lot of that stuff. That's usually where you can find me if you need me. Um, I'm focusing on the consensus layer. I'm going to talk a little bit about the consensus layer team. I'm going to talk a little bit about the work we do and how that kind of differs from the application and execution layer um, and the stuff that's in scope and not. Uh, I did do some malware RE at Google as a security engineer. I focused a ton on like applied crypto projects in the past, a lot of distributed systems. Uh, some of the same problem sets that we face today, um, some a lot different. I did a lot of embedded RE, uh, a lot of nat and native code reversing, um, RF, baseband stuff. I have an electrical engineering educational background. Um, yeah, Tor, distributed systems, blockchains, these things are uh, kind of always been on my roadmap, and uh, here I am getting to focus on them full time. I'm really excited to kind of see the blockchain ecosystem and especially Ethereum evolve to where you can. Uh, pay the bills with it, and uh, not just research it on the side. So I love where we're going in this industry. <clears throat> uh, this is the Who Am I for the EFCL security research team. Uh, we're a team responsible for security research on all the Beacon Chain client implementations. Today I'm not going to talk a ton about uh, like the spec design and the rationale, um, security around proof of stake in that sense. Danny Ryan will be on right after me and can, can kind of touch on all that stuff. There's a lot of stuff to kind of pack into a 16 minute presentation, so I'm going to blow through these things. Questions at the end, you can also just find me on Twitter if you have anything specific. Um, if it's a good public question, just ask me publicly and I'll get back to you. Um, focus on general merge security uh, beyond just the, impl the uh, implementations. We do some like crawler development stuff, look at general beacon chain health, much, much more. There's about 10 engineers on the team. I'd say five are dedicated to the team. Um, a few are, now that we're merging, we've kind of merged in the EL security team, so a few geth people on the team. Um, we've got some cryptographic expertise, someone uh, defending their dissertation on properties of elliptic curves, a lot of software security uh, expertise, uh, other people also previously exploit developers in the defense industry. So this is, we've kind of got, a, I think, a, a checkbox near most of the critical talent we need, and we're growing fast, so if you're interested, come talk to me as well. Um, our team has found and reported bugs in every CL client in some capacity, and many of the uh, execution layer clients. We've picked on some clients a little bit more than others because of their uh, critical dependencies, uh, client diversity, which I'm sure will get talked about many times today, was talked about a second ago, and I'll talk about it a little bit. Um, one thing I, I do want to say, since this is a security audience, I know there's probably a decent number of security researchers here, kind of point out the differences here. Um, what uh, are the implications of the beacon chain, right? And so, like, how does this differ from a traditional target? Um, we do have a multi-client architecture, so we don't have the, uh, the client diversity thing. Uh, I think it's referred to as, like, software monoculture, in other words, uh, in other worlds. Uh, we don't have that issue to the same extent, and we strive to potentially never have that issue in the future. So we have um, some other aspects here. We have five clients. Um, diversity is... is getting better. Um, a lot of that has to do with institutional stakers. There's some dependencies uh, for things like insurance. You might need like custodianship of keys to live off. You need remote signers. And some of the clients didn't support this previously. So our major clients are all now supporting these things. And so I, I expect that we will see a better trend in the future um, and, and kind of hope for that. Um, we do a lot of advocacy around this stuff, and I'm sure that you'll see that. I won't talk too much about that right now. Um, another thing that's interesting, all of our clients are memory safe languages for the most part. We do have some shared dependencies like BLS that are native. Um, we've gone through some formal verification for these types of things. We, we consider them critical, do manual code audits on that kind of stuff. But like, what does this mean for the traditional security research world? Um, it means we're much like, less likely to see memory corruption issues. We're much less likely to see remote code execution, like stack and uh, heap buffer overflows are not very common. At the same time, uh, the bar is a lot higher for us. The traditional CVE uh, vulnerability scoring system, the CVSS, is basically not good for us. Um, things like information disclosure and remote code execution, privilege escalation from an external attack surface are usually what's required to be considered critical. In our case, we really care about a denial of service. So you can think of things like if there was um, you know, a denial of service in Geth, that means like the chain goes down, right? Um, at Ethereum, we kind of have prided ourselves on 
being resilient to DDoS attacks in the past, and as we introduce like certain new types of complexity with proof of stake, we want to make sure that we don't lower that bar. Um, we do have a really high TVL, 34 billion right now in the staking contract as like the price and, and the queue last night when I checked. 500 plus billion if you include the market cap of ETH and all the DeFi stuff. I think it might be even 600 plus now. Um, my team isn't necessarily focusing on that half of it. Uh, for in the meantime, we're really just focusing on hammering out and testing these proof of stake clients. But we do have a responsibility to set the bar very high. Some of the things we're doing, uh, manual code audits. I mentioned BLS, formal verification of BLS. Things like libp2p um, are interesting because you can do like differential fuzzing. So there's, you know, libp2p isn't a shared dependency in the sense that it's the same code. There's an implementation for the various languages, but some of them are new. Um, like Nimbus has basically written their entire stack. Um, like the go p2p libs are, you know, pretty hardened, but there are some newer things, like the gossip sub stuff is, is a lot newer. So we really care about these things. We do a lot of manual review of stuff like that. Um, anytime we re introduce like new code that hasn't really been tested, things like uh, the sync committee functionality in Altair, that's like a whole bunch of new code that um, you know we're like, hey, we probably should do manual reviews on this. Sometimes we pay for third party audits for certain things like this. Um, but you know we try to kind of prioritize where we look for things. Um, <clears throat> fuzzing. Obviously, we do some fuzzing. We have dedicated fuzzing infrastructure. Um, we hand out some contracts. Sigma Prime has written some, some beacon fuzz infrastructure stuff that's really cool. We have this stuff uh, running on massive uh, cloud computing. We've been donated some huge clusters from Block Daemon, like 50 gigs of RAM and 256 thread machines. So these things are fuzzing as we speak. Um, it's really thank we're super thankful for that. Um, you know, sometimes cloud stuff can can be expensive, and sometimes we just get an extra uh, a little gem dropped in our lap. Uh, some of the things that we're doing, um, especially majority clients, uh, looking at critical attack surface like RPC handlers. Um, What's interesting about having a multi-client architecture is that um, you don't just have to kind of like be resilient against bugs. You have to be resilient against ambiguity in the spec. So um, things like the fork transition, they're very critical. So we do differential fuzzing on things as well. So um, you know, testing all five implementations at the same time with the same test case, looking at where the states may diverge, things like this, um, which is very interesting. Um, we have uh, some really cool AST-based autofuzz harness generation that we'll open source later, probably in a month or two. It's still finding bugs at the moment, so we'll kind of hold off on there. Uh, but I can speak a little bit about it. It's pretty cool. It's my like little baby project right now, my brainchild. Uh, basically built on the Go parser library, so you can think Geth, MEV Boost, uh, Prism are kind of like our, our Go clients. It can look at the AST and, and every single uh, exported function, it can kind of like extract what the function interface looks like. So what, what kind of arguments does it take? And it can rely on um, the new Go 1.18 basically supports, this release supports um, fuzzing right in the testing library. So it can make, you can say I need a, you know, an int64, a string, a, a, a slice of bytes, whatever it may be, and it can like intelligently know how to type these things. Um, the other cool thing is that uh, you can grep down into this, you know, all the reachable code um, in, in a source tree, and you can say like, hey, I don't need to brute force you know, a 20 character string. I can just see every single place where a string is referenced further down this, and I can actually bootstrap my test corpora that way. Um, I think in the future, <clears throat> you can expect that uh, the next iterations of the project would be like, uh, actually instrument the code, run the code, save test cases on all of the instrumented functions and kind of bootstrap your corpora instantly um, and automatically with valid beacon blocks, with valid uh, transaction messages, RPC requests, and then you could do mutational based fuzzing off that. Static analysis stuff, we do some um, vulnerability primitive scanning. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard of CodeQL. SimGrep, which is like very similar semantic repping. Error prone for Java. These things are looking for like common mistakes, like uh, is, is it possible to get a negative value into the index of an array and just cause a panic? Um, things like this that we can kind of integrate uh, into the CI and, and kind of watch, um, you know, as soon as a bug is introduced, like immediately get a report. A lot of this stuff is not necessarily, um, like it can cause a lot of false positives, but at the same time, it's, it's kind of like a thing to kind of help us follow our nose and know where to look. Um, one of the other things that I didn't mention before about the difference between this and like previous uh, security research targets I've had, this is all open source. So anytime you have a parser um, and, and almost 
every one of these languages is supported in some functionality. Um, we have the ability to do things like this. Um, I, you can think of like even uh, primitives where you have like a certain type of function. I, like in the native world, you could have, you know, a uh, mem set or, or, or a mem copy, and uh, I want to find every place where the like length parameter of that call comes from the stack or something. And so this kind of allows us to write rules that um, sometimes we can be client agnostic and, and have a rule that kind of spans all of them. Um, but sometimes we have to, you know, CodeQL doesn't like support um, Rust, for instance. So we have to, you know, find another thing like uh, I, I believe SimGrep does. Another thing we do, <clears throat> we fund crawlers. Um, NodeWatch.io is one of them. Um, there's a few other. Uh, we, we track the crawler statistics. We really care about things like diversity, and a lot of people you know, look at diversity and they're like, oh, prism, 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 too, too much client diversity, the dependency's too high. But everybody's using Linux, right? Um, half these people are using AWS. So, so looking at these crawlers and trying to um, you know, determine GOIP dependencies, um, is, is, is everything running in a data center in Berlin? You know, um, is this a, like an education, a .edu, uh, sub, uh, 16 subnet? Like things like this and, and kind of say, hey, uh, do we recognize this person? Is this an institutional staker that we know um, and can call up on the phone and say, hey, we, we have some recommendations for you? Um, we analyze participation rates. We analyze things like uh, attestation timing anomalies. Uh, I'm sure everybody knows Proto. He did some really cool stuff called Beacon Pixel, where he basically like colors pixels based off of attestation latency. So we can see things uh, over time, like entire data centers going down. Um, maybe a deep sea underwater cable was cut a few months ago. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. We're not sure, but we need to kind of be aware of these types of things. Um, so yeah, pretty cool stuff there. Um, general network health. Ooh, wow, four minutes. I'm going to start blowing through this, guys. Uh, <clears throat> network level simulation and testing. This is pretty cool. Um, one of the issues we have with distributed systems is that it's very difficult to fuzz them uh, deep in their states. So if we want to do something like fuzz the RPC interface um, you know, that's exposed to the network, we have to like, gut it out of the system and fuzz it. We have to like, neuter the caches and things like you know, remove places where there might actually be bugs hiding that we don't want to do that. So how do we go about uh, getting these distributed, very social programs um, into environments where we can fuzz them. And so we, we leverage some third-party tools, Antithesis and Kurtosis. Some of these platforms are really cool, like Antithesis has the ability to have a deterministic hypervisor at the network layer. And I don't mean like the network, like, like OSI model layer, I mean like all of your VMs can run on a local network without external dependencies. So an entire beacon chain, execution clients, um, you know, they go through the, the whole deposit, they make the, they, they practice the merge, and we can have determinism there. So we can fuzz these things. We can pause threads. We can find race conditions this way. Um, we can uh, run fuzzers and, and have determinism, and they can take snapshots and like rewind and, and go back to find interesting states. Um, Stuff is really cool. Uh, doing previously a lot of research on things like Tor, this was always a very difficult problem. Um, reproducibility, you get a fuzzer going and reproducibility was like a pain. Previously, you'd have to like save off the, your last 50 or 150 fuzz test case seeds and hope you can reproduce it. But things like race conditions, you know, it's, it's not very deterministic, so how do we find those? Um, so that's a lot of really cool stuff we do. I think we are getting down to the two minute line, which is great because I got to this other effort slide. Um, if anybody has specific questions about things on here, I can answer them, but I will just blow through them pretty quickly. <clears throat> Another thing you can do is down at the bottom, blog.ethereum.org. There's a little bit of mention of all this stuff. We have the, uh, if you search secured, um, there's like a, a few blog posts that we've put out so far. Um, but yeah, we do some third-party auditing. We pay for like formal verification of the BLSC libraries. Um, I mentioned the client and infrastructure diversity research. We're, we're potentially going to fund some more research that's more at the uh, like dependency level. So you can think of like client diversity, where you know uh, your your Teku or Besu might have the like the Logforge or Logforge, whatever you want to. But I know it's going to be kind of debated what people like to call it. Um, but yeah, you could potentially like remove the library entirely. We could put a different BLS library in there. And how do we like automate uh, generating like a very robust and diverse, uh, not monoculture based uh, beacon chain client system? 
We do a lot of merge thread analysis, you know, ask questions like, do we need to rent a bunch of hash power in case the miners revolt up next to the merge? Um, obviously, there's always FUD uh, when you're the biggest, the biggest, best chain in the room. Everybody likes to pick on you. Um, yeah, I'm not a maxi, but, you know, I believe in what we're doing here. Um, operational security, there's a lot of, like, Vitalik says, buy this token, send me one ETH, I'll send you two. Uh, we have stuff like that, so we pay some third parties to, to look at, like, Instagram and, and Twitter and, you know, things like that. Uh, I know that you guys have seen like all the bots that come. If you just say MetaMask in a tweet, you have all the friends in the world. Uh, you'll never be alone. Analyze your firewall logs and just say MetaMask on Twitter. It's instant friends. Um, we do have a client security group. Basically, this is like all of the L1 devs. Um, and we get them together in a room. If we see things like mistakes uh, and interpretations of the spec, we make sure to cross-check other clients. Um, you know, when there might be like some small update, like the, uh, the gossip sub limit is, you know, expanding, we go actually do like manual review checks of those. Um, we also, you know, if, if, if we do hear about a, a critical vulnerability coming down the pipeline, we can bug, uh, bug our, our relationships with these guys directly, and uh, they've always been really great to work with. Future spec designs on the roadmap, not so much previously. Uh, our team's looking at uh, spec in the future, and it looks like I am out of time, right on the line. Does anybody have any questions? I didn't think you guys were gonna let me off that easy. Any questions for David? Thank you, David. So we do have uh, four minutes for questions at the end, and we're going to try as much as possible to leave it open because this is a discussion, and the four <laughs> minutes is really the only time we get for the audience here as well as on Twitter to be asking questions to all, all the people attending. Yes, sir. Uh, would you mind, would you mi just, just so that people can hear, would you mind coming here to the center stage? What's the coolest bug you have ever found? Uh, we found a few, like, packets of death on majority clients that could bring the beacon chain down at one point in time. Um, we do have some, some parts of our team that look outside of just the consensus layer ecosystem. So Yoav has found and, and released a blog post about um, the OVM bugs that he found. So, you, you know, fraud proofs that could make it possible to do a double spend on optimism, things like that. I imagine post-merge, uh, the scope will kind of open up a lot for our team. So you can think of things like Maker uh, that are systemic um, in the application layer. L2s obviously are like a big deal. If an L2 goes down, like that could be a, that could just destroy Ethereum with all the TVL that they have. Um, but yeah, I think uh, one thing that we do see is it's really difficult to get an RCE. Um, in, in these clients, which is good because like lifting keys off of a, off of a validator would be horrible. Um, it would be difficult, you know, there is a different withdrawal key um, than the, the validator key, but you could still grieve the validator, uh, like ransomware, like, hey, I'll get you slashed unless you pay me kind of thing. Um, so we, we, we are robust against that, but right now I think that uh, the, the, the big meat of what we found and what keeps us up at night is all these denial of service vulnerabilities, right? Any other questions? I'll keep asking questions if no one else does, even if they're dumb. Um, so I guess one question I had is, and I missed half the talk, so maybe you already talked about it, but uh, wh how far do you see like economic vulnerabilities like fall into the scope of like the security team versus like maybe other teams at Ethereum that are thinking higher level? Like as an example, What's the impact of uh, like stable, centralized stablecoin issuers on what happens in a hard fork, like stuff like that? So that's absolutely something we care about. Um, I'll put it this way. There's not a protocol developer at the EF or adjacent to the EF working on Ethereum that doesn't have an adversarial mindset. So um, one of the really cool things about this compared to uh, like traditional security research is that crypto economics and incentive design is like a pillar of the whole thing, right? The, the code can be perfect and you can see things like this most recent bean exploit. Um, if you don't design the, the incentives right, somebody could get a flash loan and basically like take over and change your, your code. Um, you know, stablecoin pegs fail, things like that. Um, I do think that 
um, on our roadmap is the critical dependency of centralized stablecoins. So, you know, if there was a fork, we're basically all going to have to go with whatever USDC does, right? Um, you know, Maker would even have some vaults that might be insolvent. So, I think that um, advocacy around this is important. But for us specifically, uh, at least until the merge, my team is like predominantly just like heads down in the implementation code for the the consensus layer clients. And now, you know, we've kind of merged some with the Geth team. Um, definitely looking at Geth. Geth is in scope. It is such a critical dependency. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Great question, by the way. All right. Thank you. Thanks, David.